Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Fighter Heart Podcast. I'm Joe Rizzo, and today I'm sitting here with Rachel Bookman. Thanks for joining us, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. So in the Fighter Heart Podcast, uh, we like to get right into it. I like to hear a little bit about what your you know, upbringing was, where you're from, maybe. Uh, give us a brief history, and then um, get right into your Fighter Heart story. All right, so I'm originally from right outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, in a town called Bryn Mawr. I grew up there with my mom, my dad, my brother, and our dogs. Um, we had, depending on how old, two, three dogs. Um, and so it was a nice childhood. Um, I don't have a ton to report there. I It was a relatively normal um childhood. I was a little slower than my peers. Like if we were running laps in gym, I would always be last. I was a little clumsy on my feet, but nothing alarming. Um, and then my brother, he was two and a half years older than me. Um, and so he was born four months premature. And so he always had health issues, was always going to doctors. He definitely had low muscle tone he was diagnosed um, via bi muscle biopsy with a rare form of muscular dystrophy, and he went into congestive heart failure when he was 10 years old. So I was seven at the time, and my parents actually, it was like the end of the school year, and so I went to live in Florida for a couple months with my aunt and uncle, and my brother had his heart transplant when he was 10. And then after my brother was transplanted, I came home. And my parents had me tested via muscle biopsy. And that was on September 11, 2001 at CHOP. And uh, I was That's, the... It was the chances of that. I know. And just crazy. So they actually shut down the hospital while I was already in surgery. Um, and so I was the last patient of the day because they thought they would be getting... Uh, people flown in or coming in from New York. Um, and so I remember waking up and no one was there. And so I just tried to get out of the, the hospital bed. I fell right back. Oh, sorry about that. I fell right back down. Um, and then all the nurses came running alarm bells and they, they put me in a chair. And I just remember watching the TV in the waiting room with all the nurses, my parents, I didn't really understand what was happening at the time, but I remember I had a blue slushy and, and so, yeah, a week later, or so my parents got the call that it came back positive. Um, and so from that point on, I was followed regularly by cardiologists. There was nothing really neurology or anyone else could do. It's a rare type of glycogen storage disease. It's a variant of type four. So it's not even the normal, the normal type four, which is already rare. There's it's a variant of that. And there's only seven people ever diagnosed, including my brother and myself. Um, so Are you, is this something that you're born with or can you develop it? So it's genetic. It's something we were born with. Um, and actually now they do have a genetic you can test for the gene. My parents actually started a fundraiser. It was the um, Save a Heart Fund. And so there is a bike ride every year from Valley Forge to the Jersey Shore that raised money for research. And there's now a test for the gene. So that was, that was really cool that now we have that, but we didn't at the time. You had to have a muscle biopsy to be diagnosed at the time. Um, um, so yeah, it's genetic. Mm -hmm. The My parents, no one on either side, we went back. My mom got really into it and went back at least 10 generations on either side and no one has ever had it in our family. Our entire extended family were tested. They gave blood and all these sorts of things for the research. And um, my brother and I are just the two lucky ones, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, you said seven people ever or per year? Ever whoa yeah wow that is that is uh those odds i can't you can't even calculate that that's that's so how can i know you were young when um you were diagnosed but um can you remember anything about how your life changed before and after the diagnosis aside from i said you, you said you had caretakers following you around 
No, I didn't. Um, now I do. Wow. Um, but it, the the conditions progressive. But at the time, I was relatively nor like normal. Um, I was just a little slow, a little clumsy on my feet. Uh, but like if I was, I had mentioned like if I was we were running laps in gym, I would be one of the last ones. And um, but yes, after I had the muscle biopsy, I no longer ran laps in gym. Um, you know, I had to watch my physical exertion because with muscular dystrophy, at least my type, um, you can break down your muscles, but you can't build them up. So like when you work out, you're breaking down your muscles, right? And then that's how you get that bump on your arm because it's like the muscle rebuilding back up. Or the, um, and so I can break down my muscles, but I can't build it back up. And so they didn't want me doing any unnecessary physical exercise for that reason. So I would just sort of be in gym class or sit along um, and watch. And then in high school, I got a study hall instead of gym and that sort of thing. I had an elevator pass in high school because at that point I mentioned it was progressive. So I started showing symptoms, I would say, in the middle school, early high school. Um, so stairs became difficult. Getting out of a chair became difficult. Um so you said it, it's progressive. You said it got worse as you got older. So what were the steps or was it just like you didn't really notice it day to day? It was just gradual and you're like that, I guess. Yeah, very gradual. Um, hard to notice day to day, but stairs became more and more difficult and getting out of a chair became more and more difficult. I went to multiple physical therapists and they were trying to you know, to keep my muscles healthy or relatively, and they're like, we're going to make it so you can get out of a chair normally. They tried muscle stims, they tried everything, um, and it just wasn't happening. But I, um, I would say the biggest way that it affected me before and after was cardiology. So I was followed every three to six months from the time I was seven years old, and I would have an echocardiogram, EKG, and on the echo, they could see my heart was enlarged. It was functioning not so great. And that was very slow progression, but they were following it. And so I went into heart failure when I was 18. Um, and they put me on some medicines for like, okay, I was actually on the rowing team. I was a coxswain on the rowing team in high school and freshman year of college. But that's a lot of physical exertion, isn't it? So for the rowers, it is. For I was a coxswain, so I just steered and yelled at people, um, <laughs> which I'm really good at, by the way. <laughs> um, I mean, even and, yelling takes energy. So it's funny you say that because that's actually when I first went into that first round of heart failure, we had an indoor practice and had like rain the night before. The river was moving too fast, so we weren't allowed to go out in the river. So we were just inside and they were doing some sort of circuit, running laps in the gym, up and down the steps. And so I was yelling at them the time and, you know, how many more laps they had to do. And I was just, you know, kind of not running the workout, but, you know, letting them know where they were, that sort of thing. And I'm like, I'm so out of breath at the end. And I'm like, why am I out of breath? I was literally yeah. sitting still yelling at people. There's no reason I should be out of breath. And so... My friends, we would, they would go to the trainer afterward to get ice baths, that sort of thing. So I went with them and I'm like, hey, like I'm feeling out of breath. I don't know why. They took my heart rate. And they're like, you need to go to the hospital right now. Oh. And my heart rate was like over 150. And again, just resting, right? Just yelling. And so my I went back to my dorm. My friend stayed with me until my parents got there. They took me to the hospital and that's when they sort of put me on some heart failure meds, which they had sort of, throughout childhood, like I said, I was followed. They sort of threw some beta blockers. They threw sort of these different cardiac meds at me just to try to prevent. But at this point, I needed more. Um, and so they're like, okay, no more rowing teams. Too, the schedule's too hard on your body. And let's try this. Um, so at that point, I was a spring admit at University of Miami. I was like, okay, bye Philadelphia, bye cold weather. And I went down for January um, in Miami, um, started rushing a sorority. And the night before initiation, I, again, was having trouble breathing. 
went to the the hospital doctor and they're like you need to go right home right now in your lungs like you need to go home and I'm like I'll go home tomorrow after initiation mm-hmm. and so I flew home and that's when they listed me for transplant um and so I had a week to go back to Florida pack up my dorm room say goodbye to my friends move back home and then I was on the transplant list from February or March until I was transplanted in April or I'm sorry August August 4th, 2013. 2013. So this was 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Yes. I just had my 10 year anniversary in August, hard anniversary. Wow. So, I, so what was the difference after that surgery then? That was tough. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that was, at that point I was still walking. I was still ambulatory. I actually fractured my kneecap in the possible. It's just crazy. It was some of the medicines I was on. Um, you fell? I fell. Yeah. And um, I had, from some of the meds I was on, I have osteoporosis. And so it was an osteoporotic fracture. And But it was like, okay, well, you need to keep walking for your heart. But normally we don't have people wait there on this injury. And they're like, your heart's more important. So I would still walk in the halls, even though normally I would. With anyway. <laughs> yeah, never a dull moment. That's for sure. Okay. Um, but the hospital stay, I have to say, it was over the summer. I... So I was home on Miller Known from like February, March, in and out of the hospital until June. And then I was inpatient from June until um, August, because once you're on a certain dose of Miller Known, you have to be in the hospital full time. When I was home, I had a defibrillator vest on. I had my IV bag in my purse. And so it was that was a little bit different. Once I was in the hospital, though, it was June. So a lot of my friends were home for the summer. And they came and visited me. We played Cards Against Humanity. The nurses were like older sisters to me. Um, they would come in on their days off and do my nails. And they'd be in my room. We'd be listening to music. It, it really um, it really helped to pass the time having friends and, and nurses who became friends uh, there and family, of course. So after the transplant, I was home for, my doctors wanted me home for a year. And I was like, I really want to go back spring semester if I can do all my cardiac rehab, you know, if I'm doing okay, no rejections, that sort of thing. Like, can I go back in January? And like, okay. Um, so, so school was kind of like a motivation for you to go back? It was. It was. And I did. I had a boyfriend at the time and he was at school. And so I really wanted to get back to, you know, to him too. So just being back with my friends, back with my boyfriend, back in school, being back, being doing normal things for a 19 year old Mm -hmm. um and so that was my motivation really was just to get back to normal life and not feeling sick and stuck I remember feeling that you know I was just sitting in a hospital and my friends were living their life they were going to school they were going out with friends and I was just I felt very stuck um so I wanted to get unstuck and get back on back on track um and so I think that's sort of something with disability, time passes differently. And time is something that is different when you're going through chronic illness, I think. Um, so when I was first home from the hospital, I it was very hard to get out of bed. It was very hard physically to move. My mom was helping me. Um and I would just, we, I remember we would go around the mall and just walk the mall and that would be my exercise. Um, she would get me outside. I taught myself how to knit, just things to pass the time. Um, lots of doctor's appointments, uh, lots of heart counts, which were not fun. Uh, they go in through your neck and we sort of had this routine that I would go. When I was on the table, my mom would get me a, a smoothie from Potbelly and take my pills afterwards with the smoothie. And um, that became sort of my normal. We did go to Florida to visit um, like that October or something, just for a week or two. And then I was back in January for school. So Nice, you did it. I did it. I had to fly home every three months for follow-up. And I had to get blood work down there more often, which I would get like a quest and they would, you know, fax the results or whatever to transplant. So they were still very involved. 
Um, but I was able to get back to school and and continue. So how did the that semester, how did that full year of school go, your sophomore year? Um, so that was good. So I um I took a lighter schedule. I was part-time. I think I took three classes. So what was that like? nine or 12 just under 12 credits I think um because I had some labs in there too um and it was good it was definitely an adjustment um but I was just happy to be back and I think it was good to transition with part-time I think full-time I was also a double science major and I think it would have been too much so I think easing back in was the right way to go at least for me yeah I mean, I know you're, I know you said it's a chronic illness, so I know it doesn't really ever calm down, but like, did things kind of calm down? Did you get in a routine at that point? Like after your sophomore year, was your junior year, like more, you knew what was coming, like, you know, I would, no surprises. Um, I'd like to say there were no surprises, but like I said, never a dull moment. So at that point I was still walking. I actually had a mobility scooter that I would use at that point. I got it um, when I first went to Miami, my freshman year. So before my transplant, I had got a mobility scooter. But at that point, I was taking my mobility scooter, parking it it outside of the classroom, and then using a cane to walk from the outside of the classroom to my seat. And then I got to a point where I could barely get out of the seat. I was having falls with the cane. It just, it wasn't safe anymore. And so at that point, I transitioned into a wheelchair. I started using a wheelchair. And so that that was a huge adjustment, getting used to that, um, transferring in the car and all these sorts of things, just living my life. I would um, be having a shower chair and even like uh, transferring to the shower chair. And these were all things that I was trying to learn also while being a full-time student. And that was really hard, Um, especially when I had professors that weren't the most understanding. Um, And they thought that I was late to class because I overslept or something and not that, you know, I had fallen in the shower and couldn't get back up and needed to wake up my roommate for help or, you know, so um, that was, it was, it was hard. It was hard, but, um, but it was, we did it and it, it all worked out. But what it was- are they thinking? Why, why, they know who you are, right? Like, obviously, they know you have something going on. Why would they even question it? I don't know. Yeah, you know, most of my professors were very understanding. They knew me. They, um, you know, they could see physically, like, that I was struggling or that I was, you know, going and they saw the transition right um and so there were there's just some professors that you know and just some people in general who are more understanding than than others yeah, um, but awesome. for the most part they were very supportive there's just a few that that gave, gave me a little bit of a hard time yeah yeah i got you so did you end up graduating i did yeah i graduated in 2018 oh, um yeah yeah, so I graduated. I actually started a PhD program in the biomedical sciences in California at the University of Riverside, the University of California, Riverside. And um, that move was hard. Uh, it wasn't like moving to Miami. I had family in Miami. My mom actually lived. She moved to Boynton. My parents had gotten divorced. Um and so my mom was nearby. My aunt was, was in Kendall. I had family in Boca. So in Florida, I still had like a support system. In California, I knew no one. My friend um, from high school actually moved with me and she was going to be acting sort of as a caregiver. Um, so she was going to help with laundry and cooking and that sort of thing. Um, and so... When I was in California, it was sort of one one obstacle after another, one barrier after another. Um, and so I actually moved home after a year. Um, you made it a year and then you get like, I thought you were going to yeah. take a month. Um, well, it wasn't. So it wasn't exactly things that happened that fast. So, for example, like one of the program requirements was being a California resident. 
for and you had to be a California resident, I think, was it either six months or a year to get your funding for the following years? And so I went to the DMV and tried to get my PA license to my California, a California license. So I took the written test like everybody else. And then I go to the counter. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And he's like, what? And the, the clerk was like, oh, well, I see you're in a wheelchair. And I'm like, you're very observant. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he's like, well, I can't give you your license. I'm like, what do you mean? I just saw two people fail their test, take it again right there after five minutes. And then you gave them your license, their license. I'm like, I already have my license. I passed the test on the first try. What do you mean you can't convert the state? Mm-hmm. Um, I have an address. Like, what do, you, what do you mean? Um, They needed me to do a road test, and no one was willing to get in my car with me to do the road test. You Even already though- had a license. You know how to drive. It's, yeah. it's so dangerous to get in a car with a 16-year-old. Yeah. Um, and... Road. And then they had said that, um, so on for specialty equipment, when you drive, there's a code on the back of your license. Just like if you drive with corrective lenses, there's that little code on the back. So it's a code very similar to that, but for my specific equipment. And they did not have that code in California. And so that was not an option for me. So I was like, okay, well, now what do I do? So that was like one example of sort of like a longer term, like, Uh oh, how am I going to make this work? Yeah. Um, Beyond that, I was having some health issues, access issues. We, so my mice were in the vivarium. So it was a building where everyone kept mice um, for experiments and stuff. Oh, okay. (laughs) No, no, I I have dogs, but no, I'm not rodents. Um, But so for our studies, um, where we would keep the mice. And so to access them, you'd put on a bunny suit, gloves, you know, shoe covers, go through an air shower, because there was, well, so you go into the vivarium, you do your whole, get dressed in PPE, and then you go through the air shower, and there's multiple rooms, and each room is locked, and you have a key to the room where, like, your mice are. Um, and so... To get to the room where my mice were, I had to go by a room where they had immunosuppressed mice um, for like an HIV, SIV study. Um, And so they were worried that my wheelchair would contaminate the facility and get those mice sick. And so I was told I could not go in the vivarium because of my wheelchair. My wheelchair, the word they used was fomite, which is basically a contaminant. They were saying my wheelchair is a contaminant. But doesn't the air sh- doesn't doesn't the air shower get rid of all that if it goes through? It should get rid of most of it. I mean, as a microbiol like as a microbiology major, like I understand what they were saying, but I was like, well, I can spray down my wheelchair, and they're like, oh, well, you can't use the spray we use on your wheelchair. So I looked up the type of spray. I'm like, it's used on farming equipment. If they can use it on farming equipment, it can be used on my wheelchair. And it was just like they were throwing one thing after the other. Um, and my advisor got involved and I did get access, but it was a fight. I felt very uncomfortable. I felt very unwelcome. Yeah. Um, and in that time, I was, you know, trying to say, like, I'm sterile, I'm clean. Like, I, you know, I'm not a contaminant. I won't, you know, hurt those mice. I'm not even going in this, the room with those mice. Um, but... Now I've been more open about this. I didn't say to them at the time, but I was having some continence issues. My bladder muscles were affected at that point. And so I needed surgery. And um, I was like, here I am arguing, you know, that I'm, you know, clean and everything. And, you know, I still was, um, but I needed surgery and I needed to go home. And so it was all these things, the DMV, the residency, the fighting for access, needing needing healthcare and not, you know, having anywhere to go, you know, that would accept my insurance or so all signs pointed to move back home. And I wound up having bladder neck surgery, had catheter replacement, and all that since resolved. And um it was the right decision to go home mm-hmm. medically and socially and all those things. 
but it was a really hard choice. So long story short, that is why I left California. And I was like, okay, what now? Surgery's fixed. I'm good. What's my next move? And so I started a master's of education program. Well, let me take a step back. I first was applying to work in labs and like a science lab. And I did get a job in a lab for a place where I would be pH testing dairy products. Hmm. And just making sure they're the right pH, making sure they're healthy, not contaminated. Something I could very easily do. Um, anyway, the day before I start, I drive out there, make sure like there's where to park, that sort of thing. And I don't see an accessible entrance. And so I call, I'm like, hi, I'm here. You know, I just wanted to make sure, you know, tomorrow's go and, you know, where is your accessible entrance? And they call me back and they're like, oh, well, we don't have one. And turns out the, it was a historical landmark. And so they did not need to have an accessible entrance. And so I, they rescinded their offer for the job. And not only that, then when they relisted the job, they added, must be able to lift 50 pounds, must be able to sit, stand, crouch for extended periods of time. All these requirements that were not originally in the job description, basically making it so people with disabilities won't, have, won't even apply. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, all right, well, okay, now what am I going to do? Um I can't work in a lab like that. They're not accessible. Um, what am Are I? Are they doing? all like that? Maybe it was just that lab, no? Not all of them, but I think I had a little bit of the whole wheelchair as a contaminant in my mind. I did have an interview with a well-known pharmaceutical company, and they had expressed concerns that my wheelchair, not that I would contaminate their facility, but that I could bring contaminants home with me to my home from their facility on my wheelchair and they didn't have an air shower they had like sticky pads that your wheels roll over that usually put your feet on and so I was like how am I going to make this work like what do I do um and I was like what has to be accessible I'm like under the ADA public schools have to be accessible and then I was like, all right, let me try to get my master's in education. Let me get my teacher's cert and let me try that route. And so that's what I did. I got my master's in education. I taught biology and. Um, well, this was in 2019, right? 2020. Um, yeah. So I graduated was it 2021. So it was right around the pandemic. I was going to ask, like, what happened during COVID? I'm sure something happened. Yeah, so this was sort of all during the pandemic, um, which I think I needed that time um, to sort of figure out my direction. And that, as horrible as the pandemic was, I didn't get the opportunity from that to figure out what my next steps were. It sort of gave me some time to think and reflect. Um, and that's when I applied for master's programs. But of course, I wish we didn't have a pandemic. You know, it was horrible. And as someone who's immunosuppressed, it was really, really scary. I did not leave my house for over a year. Um, had to. Yeah, it was it was scary. Um, my caregivers, like it was very, very scary having people in the house. Um, you know, I lost I lost a grandparent from it, and uh, it was just. It was very a scary time, but it was also a time where I was able to be like, okay, what do I do now? Reevaluate, um, yeah. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people who were disabled or not disabled, able bodied, kind of used that time and figured out, like, am I like doing, like, they were able to reevaluate and figure out, you know, at least I've been, I've been told or I've spoken to a lot of people that sort of changed directions during that time. Um, and so that's what I did. And so I applied to the master's program. A lot of it was online. At that point, the pandemic was sort of winding down. So I we did have in-person classes on Fridays 
And I did student teach. It was the first year the kids were back in the classroom um, full time. So I did student teach for a year. It was a year long residency. Uh, and then I taught um, the following year. You said bio, right? Mm -hmm. What what grade did you end up teaching? Student teaching was 10th grade. And then when I taught, it was ninth grade. Depends on the district. So are you still teaching now? I'm not. So I stopped last year. I was having issues with pneumonias and exposures in the classroom. And transplant was like, we can't tell you what to do. But we would strongly advise that you do not teach in a classroom. Um, so I have been doing like do some teaching virtually, nothing like full-time teaching, um, but I've gotten involved in digital storytelling mm -hmm. and um, sort of, again, switch directions. It's been a windy road, but but we're getting there. So we're current now. Is that what you're doing right now? Like, like can you give us like a day in the life? Sure. Um, well, I think it's worth mentioning too that when I was teaching, and when I had that issues with pneumonia, <clears throat> excuse me, pneumonias, and my doctors were saying, you know, we can't tell you what to do, but we're going to advise that you get out of the classroom. Um, my brother was living in Japan at the time. And he, again, having this condition, having been through transplant, pneumonias, we both sleep with a ventilator now, um, he got it. So he and I were having lots of heart-to-hearts at the time. And um, he agreed. He said he needed to get out of the classroom. He really wanted me. He was involved in disability advocacy and sort of really involved in Japan in um where laws over there and sort of very, very cool stuff that he was doing. He was getting his postdoc at Tokyo College. Um, and so he um, had advised me to apply to a Women in Solidarity uh, story jam through UMass Boston. And so that's what I did. Um, and actually a week after I applied, he had passed away. Um, and so I, he, it was a year ago this December. Um, it was from complications from the heart transplant. He was 21 years out. Um, so uh, that was hard, but I did the program and nothing was going to get in my way after my brother passed that he wanted me to do that. And that's all I wanted to do because of that. Um, and I'm so glad that I did, and he did tell me to do that um, because I shared my story for the first time. And before then, I was very um, not very open about my disability. And people would ask, like, before I was in the wheelchair, like, I would just be like, why do you have an elevator pass? Like, oh, I have a bad knee, which I had a torn ACL. It wasn't a lie, but it wasn't why I needed the elevator pass. Um, so at this point, I'm like, I'm in a wheelchair. I can't hide it. You know, Mark's involved in advocacy. I'd love to get involved somehow. And so I, that was sort of my where I told my story in that program. And then afterwards, that's sort of when I got involved in sharing my story on social media. And then I started, um, I got my certification in digital storytelling. I took a DEI certification course through Cornell um, and I facilitated, I was a co-facilitator for the Tamanachi Story Jam program for youth with disabilities. Um, and so I've really sort of fast forward to now been involved in digital storytelling and disability advocacy. And I credit that all to my brother. Um, I want to keep his legacy alive. Um, at the time he was passing, they were filming a documentary on him, and that's coming out soon. It's premiering next month in Japan, and then afterwards, we'll have showings in the U.S., and it's going to be aired on PBS, so um, I'm so excited for that, and so I've really been working to sort of keep his mission alive. He started Blind Fund, which is um, going to support students with disabilities who want to study abroad, 
um, because he studied abroad in Japan and was having lots of issues with access and housing and caregivers. And so this would help with offset some of those additional expenses of studying abroad for students with disabilities. So that's really my day to day is working with Glide, sort of raising awareness for that. Um, and every day right now, every day is different, but it, that's sort of my focus every day. Awesome. Some days I have doctor's appointments, some days it's more editing and voiceovers and, um, but yeah, I'm, next month or in the following month, we have a panel discussion. We'll do the documentary showing and then I'll be on a panel discussion. So that's sort of where my focus has been uh, the past, past I would say almost a year, yeah. That's very cool. I mean, I'm sorry to hear about your brother, but obviously I'm sure he's very proud of you. Thank you. Um, I hope so. It's 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 so hard because I would love to talk to him about this because he and I talked about it. He was like, oh, why don't you share on social media, you know, your story? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't think I could do that. Um, And he told me about this influencer that he followed that, um, used an avatar or uses an avatar and has raised millions of dollars for charities and for, you know, disability advocacy and research. And, um, Even so with I'm, AI now, like you can just make your own person. <laughs> it's true. I know AI, I'm so behind the times, but actually one of the students in the Tamadachi program used AI um, for his project. And it was really, really cool. Um, but so he and I, we, we talked about this and I would love to be able to share with him, you know, all that's happened in the past year. Um, but I know that he, he's pulling the strings up there. He's watching and I would like to think he would be proud. I would hope so. So, um, we're coming towards the end. Um, I'm happy you're, you're still killing it. So you're still doing your thing. So that's awesome. But for someone who maybe just got diagnosed with, you know, something similar, what are what are some um, tips, I guess, some advice you would have given your past self? Thank you. Oh, that's such a hard question. Um, I would say to give to give yourself space and grace, um, room to grow. Uh, for me, like I mentioned, I hid my disability for a long time, or I tried to anyway. People saw it, but they didn't really know what was happening. Um, and I think that since I've been open to it, um, I've made so many good friends and friendships. I got a service dog, and it, some of my best friends I've met through that program. And um, I would say just my advice would be to take the time you need, right, to accept. And, but also there's a community of people who would love to connect and have gone through similar things, maybe not the same, um, but there are nice people out there. And I think that community can sometimes be hard to find. And I think that the online, the internet has been a wonderful way, at least for me, as a person with a disability to connect with others who, I don't know how a better way to say this, but who get it. And so I would say, you know, when, when you're comfortable, when it's time, you know, feel free to reach out and um, it's going to be okay. Even if at times it might not seem like it, it will be okay. Um, I wish I had someone telling me that when I was going through some of my rough patches. So uh, hopefully I can do that for somebody else. This too shall pass. That's yeah. it, mm -hmm. Very cool. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you so much for your time and for allowing me to share my story with you. Um, I really appreciate it. For sure. We're happy to have you. Can you give us your social medias before we go? Yeah, so my handle is the wheel deal zero on Instagram, TikTok. I have a Facebook and a YouTube, but mostly Instagram and TikTok right now. Okay, beautiful. Thanks again, Rachel and everyone else. Thank you for listening to another Fighter Heart podcast. We will see you soon. Thanks, Rachel. Bye. Thank you.